Hi, this is JT. Welcome to my podcast, Autoethnography on Mass Incarceration. And I have a special guest here today for to talk about the topic of mass incarceration. And uh, this is Stephanie from uh, SDSU. Hi, yeah, my name is Stephanie Meisterski. Um, I'm a Project Rebound, San Diego State, formerly incarcerated student. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And um, today, my claim, my main claim for um, the assignment is that mass incarceration is a prominent issue embedded in society by a corrupt criminal justice system. So I was interested in choosing mass incarceration as my focused social problem due to the fact I actually knew someone who had been to jail even back in high school, who is actually Stephanie here with me, who is my babysitter growing up. You don't really think about how much it affects you even on the outside being a close family friend. The uncertainty of what's going to happen next and um, if you're ever going to hear from them, it's just such a powerful problem that you wouldn't really expect until it happens. And um, I remember even times where we would have to call on the phone and you only get a few minutes and it's a whole process and you have to add money on this app JPay to even just send them a picture or an uh, email. And we would go back on the emails and it was just such a great feeling to have that opportunity to reach out. Until you experience it, you really wouldn't expect how hard it is to truly reach your loved one who's inside serving their sentence. Um, how would you, from your perspective, why do you see this as such a important problem to discuss? Yeah, I would say, you know, being formally incarcerated, going to jail and prison, that I know this is a important problem to discuss because there are so many people that are in prison, which means there are so many people who are affected by it. Yeah. That means there's so many people, right? Like you said, trying to figure out how to call them. The direct families. Too. Yeah, when to hear from them. And that's stressful. And everyone goes through that when they have a family, friend, loved one in prison because how can how can they deal with it? They but have what to. would that feel like from your perspective? Would you get oh. calls often? Or like yeah. the getting messages. How was did that brighten your outlook? Yeah. So you know, before I was getting messages and calls, it was so sad. You know, I didn't know it was my first time in jail and prison. I I I, I didn't know what to think, how to how I was gonna live and survive. And then I said, oh my goodness, you know, maybe I should start to tell people. Maybe they can call me. And so at first, it was super scary. It was super scary, and that's why this is a problem. You know, because. I'm already doing my time and I shouldn't have to suffer more. And that's why, you know, there's such an issue with mass incarceration because so many people are having that problem. Stuck in this loop. Stuck and in the loop. And then you guys on the outside, we call it, mm -hmm. are dealing with it too. So, yeah, I chose the podcast as my multimedia format. And uh, just an overview, today we'll be going over conflict theory and also motivational framing and how they apply to mass incarceration along with resource mobilization through project rebound okay continuing into the discussion here's just some background mass incarceration has become a defining characteristic of the american criminal justice system overall since the early 1970s even the united states has seen an unprecedented rise in the prison population and today what is shown is how marginalized communities are the ones being targeted and disproportionately affected. Over 5 million people are under some form of criminal supervision, including nearly 2 million incarcerated individuals who are African American. This surge in incarceration has far-reaching effects on families, communities, and society as a whole. In other words, according to the ACLU, our prison population has increased by 500% since our statistics in 1970. Just based on this information alone, do you have any input based from your um, time being incarcerated or your experience? 
Yeah, thank you for that question, actually. I find it super fascinating when I hear facts and statistics like that because I've lived it. I have experienced firsthand what it's like to be on the other side of the gates of prison and jail. Mm -hmm. So I fully see that, you know, that is true. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't surprise me, you know, that the statistics and, and the numbers are so high. And continuing to rise. And continuing to rise because when I was there, I'm like, is this not, you know, a more known thing that there are these many people here? These spaces are not maintained for this number of people. Yeah, like it, it's it's not set up and it's not designed to be for that many people at one point in time. And that's what's really crazy about about it. So Stephanie, do you have any, um, do you want to share any of your background on your story just to um, kind of clarify why it's uh, important that you're here with me today f- for the podcast? Yeah, thank you so much. So pretty much, you know, mass incarceration is something that like we've all heard about probably, you know, mm-hmm. in society. And so me being a recipient of that, you know, going to prison myself and experiencing the large numbers of people in prison and how, you know, the day to day, the day to day, how our prisons are overpopulated, you know, the ratio of like staff to inmates is crazy. And, you know, and you it, were there during COVID too. Was that? Yes, 100%. I was there during COVID and we just didn't get any kind of, you know, support the officers, everybody's understaffed. And, you know, at that point, it's not really rehabilitative, you know, so it's a whole different kind of world structure. It's a whole different structure. Yeah. So it's like, you know, the facts you were giving about, um, you know, how mass incarceration has just been such a huge, you know, characteristic of the criminal justice system. That's like, I mean, I can speak from experience not working, you know, there's a lot of people you know, locked up, been to prison, been to jail, and even those who are still on um, criminal supervision, you know, they call it like MSO, which is like mandatory super supervision and stuff like that. Um, It's just crazy, you know, to come out and and be on the other side, like I was saying. And so it's important that we have these kind of conversations and look at these different perspectives to get a better idea of what's going on in, in our country and in society. Awesome. In relation to sociological perspective, Conflict theory stands out to me because it suggests that social structures and institutions result from the conflicts between different groups, often defined by uh, socioeconomic status, race, and the power we have or may not have. So meaning conflict theory in relation to mass incarceration reveals that the criminal justice system disproportionately affects marginalized and uh, economically disadvantaged communities or groups. And uh, the racial and ethnic disparities in our incarceration are very clear, with black individuals being incarcerated at much, much higher rates than their white counterparts. Meaning that socioeconomic status can play a large role, though these racial injustices really outshine that. Yeah, I think... Um, you know, using the sociological perspective of conflict theory is a really good way to explain how, you know, social institutions and social uh, structures look at things like mass incarceration because of the way they're set up, right? Like mass incarceration shows us like, oh my goodness, these numbers are huge, right? Disadvantaged groups, like you Mm -hmm. said, right? Uh, you talked about socioeconomic status of individuals, you know, yeah. co- people of color, which is somebody that I am, you know, mm-hmm. and, and the way that we're affected by these kinds of things. Yeah. It really brings to light the racial inequalities at play in our governed institutions. So I framed the claim around motivational framing, the strategy that social movements are used to inspire and mobilize people towards a collective action. So in regards to mass incarceration, this would look like generating support for reform and just overall instilling in people why it is important to care about the people and families being affected by mass incarceration. It really is because of how inhumane the conditions are in prison. 
there are human rights violations here at play that are deteriorating people's dignity. This conveys a need for immediate action for the injustices these prisoners are facing in their day-to-day -day experiences. From someone who's lived through this experience of the conditions of the prison system, what is your perspective? You know, some of the most important things that we have as humans are our rights. And when those are violated, you know, in prison, you know, you kind of really don't have anything. And when it's on a mass incarceration le or when the level's on mass incarceration like that, um, it just really shows how something needs to be done. Like you talked a little bit about reform and laws and different things to protect those human rights. And that's why this motivational framing that you speak about is so important. And do you have any personal moments where you felt your rights were violated or not fully met as a prisoner or someone formerly incarcerated? Yeah, especially as a woman, you know, being in prison, women have different needs, you know, in terms of um, sanitation products and whatnot. It was really, really a struggle to get those needs met. And those are basic human rights as a woman. And so in prison, that shouldn't be compromised. And that's something that I did experience while I was in there. So thank you for asking that. Okay, so let's talk about Project Rebound. What would you say is the mission overall for Project Rebound as a whole? Yeah, so I think something I have to talk about is when I was still in prison and I realized that there was this thing called Project Rebound that could help people that come out of prison and jail go to school. I was like, I got to do that. Mm -hmm. And you had already started your degree beforehand. So what was that like already being far along in your degree and coming back after so long? trying to just get back and finish up what was that like yeah it's like I didn't even know if they would if the university would let a felon on campus you know oh, wow. and yeah with Project Rebound that's how I was able to to be confident and know hey it doesn't matter I can go back to school and finish what I started right because once you're inside you're like oh when you come out you're like what can I still do or what limitations will I have yeah but that's awesome that they gave you that sort of lifeline to even just be a student again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it, it honestly, I can say it made all the difference between um, probably coming out and struggling and not knowing if I could go to school as opposed to going to school, getting my degree and now going into like a graduate program like Project Rebound. Let me do that as a formerly incarcerated person, you know, with a felony. So since Project Rebound is a foundation to help formerly incarcerated people get back on track, it really is carrying out resource mobilization through having a base of members and funds to spend on these students coming from this adversity. What resources were available to you and such as like financial assistance or advising and just having such a supportive community? Yeah, well, one big thing is they help with parking, right? Parking okay. is so expensive. They pay for a parking pass. Wow. Yeah, and before I was driving, a trolley pass. Okay. And like like you said, those are huge limitations and those are huge challenges for somebody coming out of prison to deal with. Commuting. Yeah, and so uh, academic advising. Uh, just to have the open communication with like a educational counselor to say, right. hey. To make you feel like a student again. Yeah. To make it seem like, hey, you've been to prison and you're still a student. That's what matters. And um, having such having other people around you who have been through this, was that also helpful? I'd say that that was probably one of the most helpful things. To have other people, you know, getting their master's degrees and getting their bachelor's degrees after doing 10 years in prison... That was unbelievable to me. And then, you know, that's that's my story. So, yeah, Project Rebound is the one who, you know, foots the bill and helps with all those things to get it going. It's really awesome the positive impact Project Rebound really has on people and even helps people strive from reoffending. So there's actually a 0% recidivism rate, which means people who join Project Rebound at any college campus in California don't go back. Like the recidivism rate is zero because people who stay in higher education that come out of prison are successful. Wow. Powerful. 
Restorative justice programs and community-based alternatives are great ways to intervene on mass incarceration. Do you want to share any stories about any community-based alternatives you've been a part of? Like a, yeah. Yeah, I I love this topic. I could I could talk about this all day long because I think um, the community-based stuff, like sober livings, drug treatment programs, like those, I think are going to be like the future interventions to really help address mass incarceration. Because what if you have somebody who's you know a a, a, a drug user Mm -hmm. and um, they have a substance abuse issue and they need a drug treatment program. And that was a very similar story for me. You know, I had multiple DUIs and I just needed help Mm -hmm. and maybe prison wasn't going to be the best thing for me, you know, maybe um, a sober living option. And so I think that's really, really important. And uh, did you have an experience with that? Yeah. So I personally was in a um, sober living halfway house and it was really intense and it was really strict. And even though like, you know, it was helpful, there could be ways that it could have been better, you Mm -hmm. know, a lot more support in the community and stuff. So I also wanted to touch on the parole system and how it's notoriously known for being based on punishment, though reforming it into a system being based on rehabilitation would be benefit society what do you think about this idea of reform for the parole system yeah and i think the reason that that's important is because when people come out of prison and they go on probation or parole the goal is to help them not to punish them yeah right to instill fear yeah and that's not helpful you know because somebody coming out of prison and jail is fragile Mm -hmm. and you know, you want them to get back into the community to be better. So reforming... Because it already is like one wrong move. Yep, 100%. Can hurt you. Yep, if they do anything, if they have any police compa- contact, they could go back to prison or jail, and that's not helpful. So going through this, do you think this kind of reform is realistic? And do you think that it is the parole system is going towards focusing on rehabilitation? I know from experience that it's trying to get better, like people who used to be on like 10 years of parole, which gosh, does that seem, does that seem really realistic? You know, they're going to, they're going to try to like make that number smaller. You know, like for me, I got off parole after a year of being out of prison and, you know, luckily I had a lot of good support systems. So it can be realistic, but at the same time, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done for sure. So as we know, there's multiple racial and gender disparities within the criminal justice system that we need to eliminate to become a more equitable society. Do you see this or did you see this while you were um, going through that? Yeah, I didn't realize like how big of a problem it was until, you know, after I got out, how um, like the racial disparity thing, like how many people um, are Mexican or of Hispanic descent over African American or white like those sort of things you start to see and realize and you're like wow this isn't this is an issue there there are uh, these problems so when I experienced that I just didn't really understand it and it's true you know you think like oh this is just the way the cards played out but really there's a kind of something else it goes to show that these racial injustices are embedded into the framework of the criminal justice system And it will continue to predominantly affect marginalized communities until these policies are changed and looked at. So ultimately, from applying a sociological perspective to the issue in mass incarceration, what is gained is a deeper understanding of the systematic inequalities and power dynamics at play. Conflict theory helps explain how the criminal justice system perpetuates social stratification and the disproportionately impacts of marginalized communities. The comprehensive reforms are necessary to create a more just and equitable society. Initiatives like Project Rebound, we can work towards eradicating the problem of mass incarceration and ensuring a fair criminal justice system for all. I ended up choosing the podcast format as I felt that talking to someone who has been and lived through the experience of the injustices of the criminal justice system firsthand was most the most powerful method to carry out my autoethnographic research while also applying the concepts we learned in class. Hearing Stephanie's story and how she related her personal incarceration to my claim about mass incarceration brought the research to life. 
Yeah, you know, I just thank you so much for your your time and allowing me to be here because I really feel that since, you know, I've been to prison, Project Rebound, all the things that I do, it's really important to hear people's stories and let them tell it and share their experience, you know, and this affected not just me, but, you know, my loved ones, family members and friends. And that's the bigger picture, you know, about how um, mass incarceration affects other people. So uh, I really thank you for allowing me to tell my story and share my experience with you today.